Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I'm your host, Carl LaDuke, and today I'm joined by Todd Mitchell. Todd is the host of the Game Dev Breakdown podcast, journalist at CodeWritePlay.com, and also the author of Inside Video Game Creation, a brand new book detailing the interviews of his best guests in a format similar to the old school video game magazine columns. Today, we're going to talk about some of his favorite stories from guests he's interviewed, the shift in gaming from the 80s, 90s, and what we're seeing now, and why Todd has an issue when big tech companies like Facebook talk about the future of gaming. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode four of season two of the Zero to Play podcast. Thank you for joining me today, Todd. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me on. This is exciting. Yeah. So, is this the first uh, time you've been introduced with an author in your in your title? It is. This is my first author intro, and beyond that, I rarely feel this well understood as I as you uh, captured me in that intro. That was perfect. <laughs> oh no, it's awesome. So you 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 launched a book five days ago called Inside Video Game Creation. And it's all about the kind of interviews that you've done through your podcast and you've, you've uh, transcribed them, followed, followed up with, with your guests again, gotten more context. And uh, what I love and what I would love this conversation to kind of be revolved around is I feel like you, you have a ton of experience from how the gaming industry has evolved from the 80s, 90s. Um, you worked as a, as a software developer for over a decade and you must have an amazing perspective of the industry. Whereas I grew up in the nineties, that's when my kind of gaming passion started. And I, I just kind of want to pick your brain a bit on, on what the industry was like back then, because I think there's a lot of value we can take as we see trends nowadays, you know, if things are, are a cycle, like most trends are, uh, we'll probably see a lot of things from back in the eighties and nineties that um, we'll see those things again. So I, I guess I, I'm going to jump around a lot this podcast, but just one question that I had, I just want to kind of get a bit more inside your mind. What was your very earliest gaming memory like? My earliest memory of games, I think, had to be on my uh, my mom's Atari. So I was playing games like Missile Command, uh, Pac-Man, early stuff like that. And then my first console was the Nintendo Entertainment System. And I had, of course, uh, Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. So those those are my earliest games. And really, I got started in the 90s because uh, I was, you know, five or six at that time. So uh, most of my memories come from the 90s also. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, okay, yeah. So you're actually not that much. That You're not that further behind me. I, I kind of, in, in 95, I was born in 94. And uh, okay. my first experience was... Um, you know Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64 and um, so you're, you're probably like a generation of consoles behind me that's that's how I kind of yeah, see it um, that sounds right video game magazines it, it seems to be an area that that you're quite um, that that was a big part of your childhood and you took inspiration from it with your book you kind of wanted to do a call back to how video game magazines uh, the interviews were were um, uh, written back then. Can you explain a bit more about that process and why you, why you decided to uh, go with that for your book? For sure. So I, I talk a little bit about this in the introduction, but when I was young, we were, you know, playing the Super Nintendo and the Nintendo. That's when I had friends. I could go to their house and stuff. You, you know how those, those memories go, but we would sit around and read those magazines, Nintendo Power, Game Pro. They go on and on. And my favorite part of those, I mean, my friends liked, you know, hey, the there are cool ads and we know what's coming out and they've got cheat codes and stuff. And I was like, but you guys, these magazines show how the games are created. And they're like, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I learned there was something maybe a little bit different about my interest in games than, than some folks. So uh, mm. I kept that with me. You know, I, I read those books as I got older, uh, read those magazines. Um, when I discovered that there were authors later on who were doing stuff like that, you know, you've got Masters of Doom and just great, really in-depth books like that, where authors really follow studios and game developers for a long period of time. 
I, there was no amount of that I wouldn't read. Mm -hmm. So that's something that drew me into the actual development side of it that I learned later on. And, uh, you know, as I, as I started the podcast and these things took off a little bit, I went, okay, I I'm ready to do a book. I would love to do a book. I had some time because we have the quarantine and everything like that. I thought, let's go to a wider audience. Like, how did I really get into this stuff? And I, I recalled that it was a lot of reading and, and learning about this stuff. And when we had the internet and websites you could check out, that's really what drew me in. And uh, I, I tell you, I've been looking at Goodreads and one of the first people to add this book to their Goodreads shelf, I noticed was a, a younger, like teenage person who I'm sure is not probably not a developer, probably just a gaming enthusiast. And I went, okay, we, we came full circle. This is perfect. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I feel like that was a huge indicator of success. If, if one young person like me went, hey, cool, I can read about how video games are made. Like, that's perfect to me. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And that's, you know, your mission is complete now. Uh, what, what is it about the, the kind of interview format that you like where it's all kind of broadcasted uh, word by word? There's, there's something special about that to me because, you know, we, we are coming to an age where we're looking around at the things that are written and the things that are presented to us. And we go, you know, authors do an important job, but like, how well did the author capture that content? How well was this story told? Was it slanted one way or another? And obviously there's not a huge agenda for, for, uh, you know, game developers to change the words of a, a creator's story or anything, but it's fantastic to me to really get it from the words of the person who did it. Uh, there, mm -hmm. I feel like there's something magical to that. I could have gone a different direction. I'm sure I had plenty of content. I could have created a narrative and uh, done much shorter, punchier stories, but I, I really wanted people to kind of get a chance to go through the words of these people. And uh, I feel like you do get a deeper meaning from, from someone's actual words. So um, mm. quotes are great. You know, I, I wrote one chapter at the end, uh, in more of a narrative tone, but uh, I felt like this was a great way to capture the just the pure essence of what they wanted to get across. So I, I hope that comes through. Yeah, no, I and you sent me a copy of the book over the weekend before the podcast, and I really appreciate it. I flicked through it, and it's definitely something I want to read um, cover to cover, just because you can learn so much from other people's experience. And and that's something I'd love for you to to maybe share with the audience listening is is there is there one story that comes to mind from one of the uh, developers or uh, people in the gaming industry that you interviewed that that you'd like to share with the podcast as, as a sort of teaser to check out your book? Something that was so interesting about this book process was, um, I, I've mentioned this also, but so many times I stopped and looked at something and made a realization that I, I had missed myself. I conducted these interviews and several times I went through stuff and went, I just realized something for the first time or made a connection or really got the, the deeper meaning from somebody and, uh, you know, you know, you run a podcast, you know how this goes, like your listening skills increase by leaps and bounds, I feel like, if, yeah. if you're focused on that. Uh, you become better at grabbing what's going on in a conversation. Um, that's one reason I got into it. I, I wasn't very good at that at one time. But um, the things, not only that, the connections I've made from these stories, and when I went back to circle back, or I just looked at what happened since th that time with these people, a couple of these people I talked to a year or more ago. And uh, in one case, th this is terrible. These aren't all exciting stories, but we had uh, an interview with Jordan Michael Lemos of uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. He was a, a writer who contributed to the game. And he, he talked about how optimistic he was at the end of the project because Ubisoft did such a great job of keeping people on without doing big, big layoffs. And uh, he had already been laid off several times in the industry. He's a young guy. And by the time between the time that we did the interview and it went out uh, in this book, I think he had lost his job two or three different times. Wow. Uh, not, not Ubisoft, I have to give them credit. They kept him on, but he, he went to work on different projects and uh, at least two times he lost a jo his job since then. And uh, he's actively looking for a job now, actually. Wow. There, there have been a lot of really, um, not always great, but really surprising and kind of heavy realizations that I made doing this. Um, you know, also there, there's one story that's never been told before with a uh, developer who has survived incredible things. 
I had I had to tell almost his whole life story to explain the project he's working on today. Wow. He worked in uh, New York City during 9-11. He was working at one of the newspapers. He was in the middle of not only 9-11, but the anthrax attacks that happened afterwards. Um, he, he followed uh, a woman he fell in love with. He started a family in uh, Ohio after that and uh, raised two little boys while uh, she continued in that same line of work. And uh, now he's doing a, uh, a video game project with his sons, uh, one of which is special needs. And his whole family is working on this project. Now he has such an incredible story. He needs a movie about him. Yeah. So, uh, so many of these stories, it's been such an honor and a privilege to just, uh, just to try to tell the stories. And I, I'm sure I won't do all of them justice, but I sure did my best. Yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, definitely go go check it out if you guys are interested. I'm sure there's there's those and and uh, many more different kinds of stories that th things you might not even realize would impact you when reading them. Um, so definitely go check out the book. Uh, another comment you made, I, I think, in a in a podcast is you said that writing the book has has been like making a game, uh, <laughs> and and I'd love to to hear a bit more as to why that is and and what your um, yeah wh why you came to that conclusion. It's the connection is actually so strong. I'm in the process of writing a postmortem like you would about a game. Yeah, yeah. I'm writing one about the book project. So I am actually in the middle of that. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's funny because I, I stopped at like each stage and went like, okay, how is this like making a game? Because I've been through both now. Uh, you're, you're designing an experience for the end user. I mean, that's you. you okay, so like, I'm not writing a, a heavily narrative driven book, but I'm doing very uh, technical kinds of writing and editing, especially. And I have to keep thinking about, you know, how is this going to go for the reader? It goes on and on. I had to d decide whether to approach a publisher. So, you know, I had to decide if I wanted to manage a publisher relationship because I, through the podcast, I have connections at a number of, of publishers and eventually decided I'm an indie guy. This is what I want to do. I want to keep it small. I want to do it myself and on my terms. And if it goes well at all, I want to hang on to the money, you know, <laughs> it's, it's that kind of thing. So that was another thing. Scope creep became an issue. Like how much content do you put in? Do mm -hmm. you keep it manageable? Like uh, crunch scheduling, you know, I, when do I announce a date and how do I make sure that I don't have to scramble as that date approaches? And then the marketing at the end. I mean, this is, this is my attempt at doing kind of a virtual book tour. So I, I hit up all my mutuals and said, I'd love to, to jump around and sit in on some podcasts, chat with some of my friends who are doing this stuff. It goes on and on. The list is already like, I have like 10 or 15 bullet points. I want to sort of write about, about how these things were similar because it's, it's really surprising. Yeah. And, and the kind of connection that I make is uh, gaming is, is a medium, just like writing is a medium. And they're, they're both creative outlets for producing content. And, and I think the, uh, the, the sim similarities in the process, I think, just confirms one of the missions of this podcast. And that's to deconstruct whether gaming is a form of art, whether uh, gaming is a creative process, and, and, and just that, that relationship that people have with, with creating games um, and not just being a, a form of entertainment or distraction. And, and, and your story really helps, I think, confirm that where whether you decide to write a book or you know, record a song or um, make a movie or make a game, it's, there's a lot of similarities in that process when it comes to yeah, scope creep. And I, I think I'm excited to see your postmortem because I think you'll mention things that a lot of game developers might not think about, but they should think about things like marketing um, is, yes. over, is overlooked a lot when uh, with indie game developers trying to ship games. And it's probably one of the most important parts uh, when it comes to making it a success. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's really, really cool to hear. Um, that's really I talk about that all the time on the podcast too, because I, I sort of tell people sort of everything I do is a product of some kind, whether you're interested in the podcast or what I do on the website, or if you're an editor considering whether or not to, you know, take one of my articles into consideration. And so not only the marketing, but I mean, even the very technical side of it, I'm sure somebody heard me say this because I'm a programmer and I think that way, somebody's going to go, well, yeah, but you know, it's not like a writer has to learn to code. I can't tell you how many times I sat at Google trying to search like exactly where to put a comma in a sentence or when I'm editing a sentence, like all, it's all these little rules mm -hmm. that determine what to do in what situation. And it even 
you know, in English language has its own set of websites where people sit around and argue just like on Stack Overflow. So <laughs> it's, it's just a funny thing. It's just on and on these funny connections just all day. So I'm, I'm reading back these interviews of people going like, here's what happened to me in development. And I would think like, that's kind of what's happening to me right this moment. No, totally. And I think if if you look at the the process and people talking about their passion and writing or filmmakers, whatever it might be, there's a lot of inspiration that I think game developers can get for their projects. And and that's something that I'm I'm really uh, passionate about just because I came from the film industry. I I freelanced for a while. I wasn't really sure what I what my passion was, and I've fallen <laughs> back into gaming now. And I love it, and it feels the same but different and and that's one thing that i i love to see more of as as these completely different industries converging and the, the, that's, that's happening with technology you know um cg like unreal engine being used uh in films more and more each year uh and it's 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 an interesting future for for creativity i think and and just games in general um yeah so i I'd love to ask you uh, a little bit about what uh, I don't I don't really know if you if you want to go uh, very dark with this, but uh, issues with the current climate of gaming. Um, mm. I know there's a lot happening, and uh, from a lot of the the content that I listened to to you speaking about, I feel like you've got a really good um, understanding of of the current. Um, industry, uh, you, you've you gone to a ton of conferences and seen a lot of talks and written articles about a lot of interesting topics. And I'd love to know just what your thoughts are on the current state of the industry. And it could be in, in any area. Um, and if there's any anything you'd like to share there. It, it's such an interesting uh, topic. And like you said, it's kind of, it's not the most positive and upbeat thing, but it's I think it is important that we're able to talk about it and look at the things that are happening and kind of try to figure out not only what do we do, but how do we kind of look out for our own well-being and the, the sort of mental well-being of the people around us. Uh, it's, it's such an odd thing. I asked several people who I interviewed in the book alone, uh, but I ask people this all the time on the podcast, like, how do you deal with stuff like toxicity? How do you deal with uh, some of the stuff that goes on at a major studio? Uh, I had mm. spoken with two people from uh, Gearbox about their work on Borderlands 3, um, one before the game came out and one right after the game came out. Both of those guys ended up in the book. And, you know, in one case, I had to, I had to tell the guy, like, look, I know you're in the news every single day right now. I'm stunned that Gearbox allowed this interview. Uh, because and it's it wouldn't have been anything bad against them if they decided we don't want them to talk to anybody right now because mm. every single day they were pelted for a different reason you know something happens with uh, with Randy or something happens with the Epic Store and I was grateful that I had a chance to take somebody from the creative ranks talk to them for an hour and say how are you holding up, man? You know, how do you deal with this? Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard a lot of what you would expect. I heard like, you know, hey, I'm just, I'm a creative guy. I go every day and try to make cool stuff with my friends. Um, sure, he's got a big budget behind him. He's got a publisher looking after their interests. But, you know, the, the negativity, the publisher can't do anything about. They can't protect the creative people from those negative vibes on Twitter when mm -hmm. they, you know, when they want to just connect with friends or, uh, you know, seeing what's going on on Reddit or whatever. And it is, it's, it's, I felt very sympathetic because I realized it's not a whole lot different if I were to make a game tomorrow that everyone resented for some reason and mm -hmm. what you're doing here. You go in and you work on audio or you work on mm -hmm. VFX, you still have to deal with that. And, mm -hmm. you know, 2K gets to make a decision that you have to deal with for the next three years, you mm -hmm. know, so... It, it's a tough thing. And I, I totally understood when they said it's sometimes it's you're just on top of the world and sometimes it's it's a nightmare. And this changes over time. The the way we have social media now, before that, uh, I talked to another guy who had written a design book, uh, Richard Rouse the third, who wrote one of the one of the earlier books on game design. And he said the very first review on Amazon, and this was back in like 2001 was someone just completely trolling the game like this 
or the the book, sorry. Uh, this didn't have code in it. I expected something else. This is garbage. And he goes, I just sat there. I didn't know what to do, you know? Mm -hmm. So as the technology changes and as the trends change, we have to really stay on top of this and see what are people doing? How do we deal with it? And like, how do we try to keep a positive mindset? So it's, it's something that's so hard to track, but I do think it's important that we keep talking about it. Totally. I, I haven't really had much experience with, um, I guess, cancel culture and um, negativity online and things like that. But um, my, my day job at, at Rocketworks, uh, we're about to release a new survival game. We started putting out marketing content. And I've noticed mm -hmm. that on a daily basis now, I'm, I'm looking at the new comments that have come in. Every time a, a new post gets, gets posted, I, you know, I look and see what people's perspective is. And it, it is definitely a almost addicting part that you know it doesn't really bring much value at the end of the day you can't really interact with those people you can't share any information that's um that's not released yet and it is this weird relationship of like what am i trying to get from this need to to know what people are thinking um it's definitely something that that is getting it's becoming easier and easier well i suppose yeah any game that's doing a good job of of marketing and getting more eyeballs to, to see it is going to get as much an equal amount of, of hate uh, towards mm -hmm. that as well. Uh, and that's just, yeah, I think something that companies need to just be aware of um, blocking out, I guess. I grew up in, in the kind of internet age and I, I feel like I can numb that part and, and not take right. criticism, but, and like, I feel like I have a thick skin, but if it's personal to me, and, and, or a game that I've, you know, put years into, I don't know how I'd, I'd really react to that situation. And this is a theme that, that actually comes up in the book in almost every chapter, because, uh, so I, I spoke to the triple A side of it, but I also, uh, opened the book in one of the first chapters, uh, my friend, Michael Hicks, who only lives a couple of hours away from me, actually, we, we met in person at an event and it was, it was a really nice, opportunity that I found to uh, include him in the book, but he is a solo indie, eh, not always a solo. He works with uh, one artist friend sometimes, but he's put out two or three projects that have each had like hundreds of thousands of players. Like for an indie person, he's doing exactly what you hope to do when you mm. set out to make games. So, um, but he, he doesn't make textbook, you know, uh, you know, shooters or platformers. He does kind of unusual semi-experimental uh games that are very personal to him mm. the uh the last one the path of modus was it it's not it's not a very thickly veiled uh commentary about his own life and his relationship with his father and uh it was it was touching it was heartwarming and it was a lot of fun to talk to him about you know what was the inspiration for this and you know how did you decide to do this and how like our my question to him was are people getting it mm. and uh you know, I, I researched this for the interview and for the book. And I think the answer in part was no. I mean, there were a lot of players who played it and wanted to do some fun platforming. And mm. when the story got too involved, they got mean. Like there are some rough comments that I, I am so sorry that he had to, to go through if he's looking wow. through that. And he admitted to me that like near the end of the process, he had kind of a time where he had to step back, felt like he was kind of fighting off a breakdown of some kind, wanted to give it all up. And it's exactly the kind of stuff you worry about. So that that criticism is tough, whether you're on a giant team or, you know, it hits a lot different when you're a soloist and you're doing very personal stuff. And uh, unfortunately, shortly after that interview, uh, his father actually passed away mm -hmm. and the story became even heavier. And I, I can't even imagine, like, I've done this stuff for a while. I tell people all the time. I work online. You can't hurt my feelings. And it's kind of a, a joke. And I, I tell people that so they can feel free to be honest with me. But I mean, that's not really true for any of us. Mm. We, you know, we, we've all got uh, a level of criticism that we're not prepared for. We've all got, you know, a hot button here or there. It's, there's no good answer. And <laughs> if, if you want to work in this space, you are absolutely signing on for a certain amount of that. And you have to be prepared because, um, mm, there's, there's almost nothing you can do to really keep yourself impervious to that. Yeah, it must be something to do with, with gaming itself being a, a medium where you have to, you know, make choices and you really kind of live inside the character. And it, I, I'm really hopeful for the future of gaming where people develop games that are, 
um, more forms of art that talk about the human condition and just like stories about their personal lives and things like that. But, but you make a really good point about how is it, is it, is it, is it just going to cause pain making other people try live through your experience and your story when, when they, you know, they, you kind of want them to empathize with, with your story and to kind of learn more about themselves through that process. But is the nature of, of games maybe too, um, I don't know, action, action orientated and it's, it's not, you're not able to kind of take play a game with the the sense of feeling something from it. And that's, it's a conversation that I, I always like to have as, as finding out if, if there are games out there that people love from a perspective of, um, a work of art, something that just makes you think about the world in a different way. Um, is that something that you've come across in your your kind of gaming journey? Uh, games that just, it's not your traditional first person shooter or platformer, but it's something that really makes you question uh, things around you. Sure. I mean, I, I really like when, uh, whether small studios or indies, or even big studios put together a small team that does something a little more experimental or a little more emotion-based things that are intended to uh, generate sympathy or empathy. I, I love seeing that. I think that's something that needs to continue and uh, we need to build on that. But as, as somebody who is involved in you know, development and somebody who's created his own projects, I feel like I'm able to see a little more of that than maybe the average person in mm. almost any game. Like, you yeah. know, if you made a small card game or something, I, I feel like I can usually pick up hints. It's probably not me that's special. I feel like maybe everybody is able to do some degree of this, but you see design choices mm. in art and, uh, you know, the music somebody selected or that they compose themselves and you pick up a lot of personality from that. I, I love that about games. Mm. And I feel like, at the same time, there are a lot of people who turn on a game and they don't want that at all. They mm. don't want to see a bit of that. You know, look at the big games, you know, what, what someone did with this Far Cry versus that Far Cry. Uh, th the list goes on. We've, mm. we've all got this, this thing. And I think part of it is gaming is, you know, we, we talk about the gaming community and people go like, well, it's not a real community or some people swear it's, it's this very important community. The, the thing about that is we're so different within that group. Mm. So many people from all walks of life, and that's a good thing, but we clash. Mm. We, we just naturally, our differences come to light because of the activity that we're trying to do together. So I don't know, like, I don't know if there's ever going to be an answer or the right balance, but I sure know on the design side that if you're deciding how much of yourself to put into a game, you've got to factor in like, how much do I want to hear about later from people mm. who don't like it? Or if I tell a deeply personal story, like we've all seen designers do, uh, people are going to come over and they're going to dump on it and it's, it's going to feel bad. And I'm, I'm always very sympathetic when I hear those stories because I, I can only imagine what that must feel like. Yeah. And, and I think it's harder than if someone was to say, put out a book or uh, make a movie because you kind of, you make that and then you put it out there in the world. Whereas with a game, you're, you're usually, you know, doing hot fixes, especially in this climate of games as a service. A lot of people want to, mm. you know, retain the, the, the user base. And that almost forces you to have to look at the, at the feedback and the comments as you're developing it right. and, and adding patches. And it's a, it's a lot harder to, um, to, to make a work of art and then just kind of leave it and walk away like you would um, a movie or, um, you know, a poem or a book or whatever, whatever that might be, uh, which, yeah, which is the sad reality, I think, of, of games in a way. So it's, it's like you said, uh, right, it, it's just like you said, you, you tend to try to figure out where you're going to, what your personal philosophy is going to be about checking the feedback, reading the comments, mm. seeing what people say about something. Um, my wife was asking me the day after the book launched, she's like, why are you still working so hard on everything? And I told her, I want to get all the, like the author profiles up and the Goodreads pages set up and everything, because then I never want to look at these pages again. I don't want to see the reviews. I don't want to see the comments. And uh, that's not true. Of course, I'm going to be looking because we all have to go back and see like, did anybody bring up any good points? Are there some lessons to learn here? But you're going to take a lot of heat uh, mm -hmm. that's not as constructive and it's it's usually going to hurt. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, I'd love to go on a different direction now. And, um, sure. and, and one thing that I think you'd have a, a really great perspective on is um, you, have a, you have a son, right? Um, I do. He, I'd love to know how he's changed your perspective of the gaming industry. Uh, how, how much do you expose him to games or will you expose him to games as he grows up? What's, what's your perspective on that? Oh, that's probably the topic of another book for, <laughs> for the future. <laughs> um, parenting, I, I'm going to say a bunch of sappy stuff. I'm really not okay. this guy. I'm a, I was a teenager who grew up playing Nintendo 64 and watching Jackass movies. And uh, parenting really did have to turn me into a different person if this child was going to survive. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm happy for the, you know, a little bit of maturity that it's brought me in addition to the goofy stuff I do on the weekends. But gaming is... I, I know the value of gaming. So when I hear everybody say all st screen time is bad or all video games are bad, I see through that. I'm able to have that discussion with somebody. But at the end of that same day, I, I have to sit down and go, is my kid ready for, like he can play rock band. We can play rock band together. That's awesome. Is he ready for a Spider-Man game? He likes Spider-Man, but do I want him to learn how to punch people in the face for two hours? We have no shortage of studies that say he's not going to punch people in the face just because he played Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. But do I still, do I want him to watch it for the next two hours? Probably not. So it's, I've had to look at that and how I want it to incorporate into the household. And then what I want him to see me do, mm. like he, you know, daddy says, I can't do this, but I know he played for three hours last night and he mm. did all the stuff I wanted to do. This is stuff every parent struggles with. I mean, yeah. um, you know, whether it's with movies or the music you listen to in the car, yeah. it's the sort of thing you, I've really had to step up and go, how firmly do I believe the things I believe about games? Mm -hmm. And so when it came time for him to start learning stuff, I was excited to find a little prototype I could make. This was my very first indie game. I wanted to make him something that could help him learn like letters and numbers and stuff. I fell back on that very positive potential that I know games have. And uh, I'm happy to say I spent about, I don't know, six months going through and fleshing that game out. I made it available to not only him, but I released it on the app stores for other kids and uh, very positive feedback about that. And that's incredible. So I, right. I'm, I'm trying to keep it positive here. And as he gets older, I'm trying to answer the rest of those questions as they come up. Now it's Roblox. Do I let him play Roblox <laughs> with the kids from class? Um, the, the thing I'm the most scared of is online play where, where people can message and people can talk directly to them. We're not going to have any of that for a long time. Yeah. Nope. And I, I, that, it's cool to hear that. And it's, it's nice that you've put so much thought into it and you've, you've made those boundaries. Um, and, and cause that makes me nervous for, for when I'm going to be a father one day, how I'm going to deal. And for, for the moment, if I'm being honest, I'm just grateful that I don't have to deal with that because I, I, yeah. <laughs> I had access to the internet at a young age. Um, well, you know, I understood the internet before my parents did. And it was, right. it was just, I don't know, this weird climate that I, like, I don't know how I'm going to treat my child one day knowing how the internet works and what's out there and uh, <laughs> yeah, what kind of, you know, games they, they're going to want to play. Uh, like you said, like Roblox um, and then just, making sure that Roblox is a safe game to play and they can't just fall onto a server where, you know, it's just not monitored or censored in any right. way. And yeah, that's, that's definitely very frightening. So um, all the best to you. It sounds like you, <laughs> you're, you're aware of all the, the kind of traps and, and areas that um, can bring just unhealthy habits and, uh, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Uh, talk to me a little bit, bit more about the game that you developed. So what, what kind of game design tactics did you use for an education game to help your son play, uh, to, to learn how to count in, in letters? How, what, what did you know uh, you could do to make it fun? That is something I kind of enjoy talking about because it was such a, an unusual time. Like, like I said before, I was a much different person earlier in life. Uh, I never would have guessed that my first commercial project would be uh, a, an educational game for young, young kids, you know, five and below. Uh, you have to have a special uh, 
certification just to put that out on the app store. So right. it was something I took very seriously, but I wanted it to be very fun. And one of the very first things I discovered was when I was playing, there was a time when I played a lot of Clash Royale mm -hmm. and a lot of mobile gamers have been through at least a stage with that game. I noticed that when my son was sort of looking at the screen and I was going, oh, look, daddy's going to do this and that when there was one well-defined action on the screen, like one button that was supposed to be hit, I, f I figured out he could figure that out. Like he mm. was only like one. He was like one year old and he could figure out when there's one thing they want you to do, push this button, he could do it. And I went, okay, that's enough. We, we, can, we can work from that. So wow. I, uh, I was learning to code in Lua using the Love 2D framework, which I still love actually. It's a fantastic way to make games. But um. I took a little time to just make scenes like that where there was one thing for him to do. So the first one I did was like capital letters in, of the alphabet. And, you know, one letter would pop up on the screen on like a floaty little cloud or something. And then it would sort of move around on the screen. You would have to touch it. And then the next letter B would come up and you would have mm. to touch it again. And using that same kind of mechanic, I mean, this, this wasn't going to get game of the year or anything, <laughs> But I was able to create about five different versions of that with like uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers. Then there was like a multiple choice quiz game. And I kept it very, very simple. I just used that. And he loved it. He, he thought it was fantastic. And just to, to see, I showed it around to some other kids I knew and parents and stuff. And they all seemed to get that right around that age range. They could all follow that thing. So I just... I built from that. I got to do a set of, you know, artwork of my own and I got to compose music for the first time since like, nice. since I took music theory in high school, which was a lot of fun. And uh, we, we made a project out of it. It was, it was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm so glad I did it. And uh, I, you know, another game might be my next thing to sort of get away from the writing for a little bit and uh, maybe bounce back and forth some. Yeah. I mean, writing a book and uh, developing a game is the same thing. So it may as well just, you know same vibe yeah <laughs> yeah exactly uh that's that's really interesting so the the main mechanic was just tapping the screen uh when the the kind of letter popped up and was that enough to to teach uh was there any any sort of way that you could prove that that your kid knew what a letter was and you know w was that the only mechanic that you really used in the game to kind of create that engagement yeah so i'm no teacher but I feel like I learned a good amount during this time. And the big difference between little kids as players and adults as players, kids love and must have repetition. It, it means mm. everything to them. And adults don't want that at all. We want a different thing to happen every time we open this game. And uh, which is natural, but yeah. kids love going through stuff and they're happy to do that. So mm. the, the test was to give them those learning scenes that three or four scenes to learn the different sets. And then the last one was kind of the, you know, I'd call it a test or a quiz, but mm -hmm. it was a level that would only progress if I showed you a set of letters and uh, my wife and I recorded audio for this. It's press the letter B or, you know, find the number four. Mm. And if they selected that right, this little bear went through the level and his rocket ship blasted off to the moon or so something silly like that. Yeah, yeah. But he got it very well. And, and most kids I, I uh, tested this with got it very well. And then that last level was uh, sort of procedurally uh, generated so it would be different every time and cool. it, it actually went pretty well it was pretty effective that's so cool what a cool little um just test case that you did and you know it worked uh, i think we're gonna see more things like that i mean education's a, a, a i think a whole other podcast episode there's oh, yeah. you know even things happening for adults and and what kind of what kind of lessons um how you can teach adults things in a in a more fun way uh that right yeah, you know, but but that's a really interesting insight that I think you know we to look at how a kid develops in terms of their um, what they find engaging and fun and and starting there I think is really really cool and um, it's really cool that you discovered that yourself. The software is critical now, especially here mm. in the quarantine world and the remote school world. It's it's crucial now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing talking about technology, I I heard you mention in a podcast that um, it was during the GDC conference uh, when when there were so many Facebook talks and and you made a comment about how you were skeptical about a, a big tech company like Facebook 
um, s- stepping into the gaming industry and trying to kind of claim those those headlines and and make comments about the the shift in technology and gaming. And I think that brings a, a really interesting question just about how a lot of the world is is merging into a gamified space where a lot of things are done virtually now. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to creating a gamified kind of service. And I, I'd just love to know some thoughts that you have about like why why do you think companies like Facebook are trying to get into the, the gaming industry and in, in front of game developers and, and what that kind of says about the state of the industry right now? Yeah, it's it's funny when when we hear about, you know, the future of technology and everything and the future of gaming. I don't know about you. I've gotten on some PR lists at this point and someone offers to, to explain to my listeners the future of gaming literally every day. Uh, so it's and, and it's usually the CEO of a new startup or something. And, and once in a while, I'll go ahead and talk to them, but not because I believe they're going to explain to me the future of gaming. Uh, mm-hmm. When we hear that from a big company like Facebook, I actually worry a little bit. You mentioned gamification. Gamification is, we, we always used to roll our eyes when we heard that term, like, oh, it's just a buzzword and we're sick of hearing about it. It's real and it's, it's very powerful. It's, mm-hmm. a very, it's a very effective means of uh, teaching, which is good, uh, adjusting behaviors. There's a lot of really advanced, really real science and data behind this. And when a company like Facebook talks about it, at GDC or anything. I didn't actually sit in on the GDC uh, presentation from Facebook. I've sat in on one from them at an audio conference last year, which was very good. Uh, they they have very technical people and very smart people. And I'm I'm not 100% anti-Facebook at all. Mm-hmm. Um, have, have a couple of friends who have gone to work there. And, but when we see a big company like that try to Eh, you you can call it take over or you know just be a strong presence in that space. I do think it's important that we ask why uh, and how they intend to do it and for what purpose. So mm-hmm. um, a lot of what Facebook is doing these days is trying to keep Facebook afloat. You know mm-hmm. they'll do anything to get a new generation involved in what Facebook does because they have a problem with that right now. Uh, younger users do not have the same interest in Facebook that uh, the older generation does. Um, As I've said in the podcast, perhaps you've heard, like, I really think Facebook's strength is, you know, connecting you to your family. They need to just probably accept that uh, thing that they have a stronghold of and uh, not Mm -hmm. worry so much about what if we could have all the VR players? Because Mm -hmm. uh, as close as we are to getting VR in the average household, uh, most of them will be under Facebook's umbrella now. So Mm. uh, at the end of the day, I think Facebook is trying to stay relevant. And Mm. some things Facebook does are fantastic and others I don't approve of in the slightest. I think we need to watch them like a hawk, especially with VR and young people. I think it's becoming more important all the time. So the best I can do is say, um, don't, I was in the middle of finishing my books. So I was uh, hit and miss during GDC week, but when they are willing to talk about, about what they're doing, we need to listen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, yeah, I, I, I guess what's, what's interesting is, is the intent of these companies isn't to make, make users have fun. Um, it's, it's to drive traffic, drive engagement, keep them, keep them interested yes. but but what i find interesting is some of the biggest games that we're seeing nowadays uh i'm thinking of like league of legends and fortnite and and mm-hmm. just the, these games as a service that are doing an amazing job at keeping uh player attention and keeping that attention from the player it, it, it's i wonder if if you know because those are the companies that are making the the most money that's what's influencing the kind of gaming industry and the studios that want to create experiences that are that are fun uh how that's shifting um and just not not creating a product anymore that tells a story but one that is continuous and that that doesn't have an right. ending anymore uh it, it does make me yeah I, I think you're right about once once facebook has some announcement once they they release the new virtual facebook or whatever it might be uh that we we should 
definitely look at it. Um, but I, I feel like the, the internet's getting smarter as well about algorithms and understanding, um, you know, how their behaviors are changing as, uh, as they spend more time inside these apps. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's something we will have to just be aware of, I guess. There's a lot more smarter people developing uh, apps and games that, that we will get hooked on, and we just need to be aware of that as the world advances. It, right, it's so powerful. I mean, Fortnite is a game that's gamified itself. I don't know if you've uh, picked up a controller recently and jumped into Fortnite, but I mean, they have like many games you're playing while you play the game now. I've mm -hmm. never seen anything like it. It's like, meet these several challenges talk to these people and all the while you're playing the actual battle royale game uh it's it's no mystery how they're able to keep kids uh locked in i mean locked in on this game it's no mm. surprise at all so it's it's something we got to be aware of and we got to keep studying that just like we do everything else totally uh we we've only got a few more minutes left of the podcast but one question that i i that came to my mind when i was doing research and and i just i'm curious about your answer and that's if if you could go back in time and spend one year at a game development studio for a specific game, which studio would that be and why? Um, is there one project that you, you've kind of heard about through your research that, that you think was an amazing environment or a place that you think some, some really amazing work happened? Um, just just standing and obs at observing that development phase. A couple definitely come to mind. Uh, one that was part of the book was David Fox talked to me about his time at uh, Lucasfilm Games before you know Lucas Arts days, and his time at the ranch that uh, where Steven Spielberg came to hang out and make games with George Lucas. And I mean that that was incredible. Not only for that reason but also because of the things like David Fox admitted to me later that he was studying psychology and you know how to uh, help people learn better about themselves and make positive changes and, and thinking of how could I do this with games. I mean, there's a lot of groundbreaking stuff being attempted back then. And uh, on the other hand of that, something outside the book's reach was, you know, I'm not the hugest Grand Theft Auto guy, but so much happened with it politically and it got caught up in such policy change and government oversight discussion and stuff. If you had been in the right place at the right time to hear about that stuff, uh, things that totally changed the course of the entire industry and that they mm. still come up all the time, there are a lot of really interesting pivotal moments like that. It's, it's a good question. That'd be almost another good book topic to sort of <laughs> capture each of those pivotal times you could have been, if you had a time machine, where you would want to be and when. It's a good mm. question. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, that's, um, that's a really good answer. Uh, thanks for sharing your insights. You clearly have uh, a, you know, an amazing understanding of yeah, those big shifts and some of the, the biggest stories in the industry. I really appreciate you sharing your perspective and how your sons influenced your view of gaming and you know, even motivated you to make your own game. That was really cool to hear. Uh, I would love to just put more attention towards your book, Inside Video Game Creation, which people can find on Amazon, I believe now. And um, is it physically in stores as well, some, some places? You can get ebook or paperback from Amazon and awesome. uh, theoretically bookstores could buy it. We'll have to see. <laughs> no, it's awesome. And I wish you the best on that journey. If you'd like to follow Todd, I love your handle, by the way, Mecca Toddzilla uh, on Twitter. And um, also check out his game development podcast, uh, Game Dev Pod. How many episodes have you done? It's over 100. Is it over 200? I saw today we hit like 140. Wow. So, nice. So yeah, that's, yeah. Um, you've been doing this for a while and uh, I do really appreciate you coming on, especially so early on this podcast journey. And I'm excited to see where you'll be in, in 12 months time. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Is there any other last uh, bits that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, I don't think so. I really appreciate the chance to uh, drop in. Uh, people can check out what I do at codewriteplay.com. Uh, would love to have you. And I'm hoping my listeners will jump over and check this out also. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you.